do that. So Deuteronomy chapter 8, starting at verse 1. The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what it was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you and your foot did not swell these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks and water, of fountains and springs flowing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. And you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so you shall perish, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. I don't know about you, but I find it all too easy to look down at other people. I find I'm all too quick to compare my life with the lives of others. I look at all the wonderful blessings in my life, my marriage and my kids and my health and my home and everything else that I have, and I'm tempted to think, I've worked hard for those things. I deserve those things. And I look at the mess in other people's lives and I think that's what happens when you make bad decisions. I don't know if you identify with that or not, but it's human nature to, as Paul puts it, think of ourselves more highly than we ought. What we often forget is that our blessings are exactly that, blessings. Blessings. Things that God in his grace has given to us. Our text this morning reminds us that when we're tempted to think we deserve all the blessings we have, that we need to remember what God has done in our past and we need to remember God in whatever he gives us in the future. And I want to look at those two things this morning. What God has done in our past 
and that we need to remember him for when he gives us stuff in the future. So let's start by remembering the Lord's provision in our past. The first six verses of our text all look back to what God has done for his people. And Moses lists five things that God has done. Firstly, the Lord led you through the wilderness. Verse 2. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. The word remember is used twice in our text and the phrase don't forget is used three times. This chapter is all about remembering the Lord. Just as an aside, the name Zechariah means remember the Lord. And God's people are to remember the whole way or all the ways that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. They weren't just to remember one thing that God has done, but all the things that God has done for their, for their people. There you go. God's people were literally in the wilderness for 40 years. But 40 years is also a way of defining a generation or or their whole lives. God had led them through the wilderness for their whole lives. And that's true for you and me as well. And maybe you've been through difficult experiences. Maybe you've been through a wilderness or two. Well, God has led you through that experience as well. You are here because God has preserved your life. You are here because God has redeemed you from sin or he wants to. You are here because God has preserved you from depression or addiction or self-destruction. You are here because God has led you here. We need to remember that God has led us through the wilderness to this very moment. So that's the first thing that God has done for his people. He's led them through wilderness experiences. Secondly, the the second thing God has done is that he has humbled you. Verse 2 says, God led you through the wilderness that he might humble you. In fact, in verse 3, Moses says, and he humbled you and let you hunger. You see, the danger we all face is that we think that we can get through life on our own, that we don't need God. But God led his people into a wilderness where there was no water, where there wasn't enough food. God let them go hungry to make them realise that they couldn't make it on their own. To make them realise that they did need God. God has a purpose in leading you through the wilderness, and that's to humble you. Paul says of his own affliction and suffering, all that was to make us rely not on ourselves but on God. When you are confronted with your inadequacies and with your weaknesses and with your inability to obey God, God is humbling you. He's reminding you that you need him in your life. You can't do this life on your own. Sometimes you and I need humbling to remind us that we can't do life without God. Thirdly, what the Lord did in our past is he tested you. Moses says that in leading his people through the wilderness, God was testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Now, now God knows your heart. He doesn't have to test you to know what's in your heart. Rather, God wants to prove what's in your heart by seeing whether you would keep his commandments or not. God leads us through the wilderness to give us an opportunity to prove our love for him and our obedience towards him. The Apostle Peter writes this, he says, For a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, 
may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Trials and wilderness experiences test the genuineness of your faith. Wilderness experiences test your love for God and your faithful obedience to him. And when you pass the test, when you remain faithful to God, Jesus gets the glory and the honour. People see the Spirit working through you when you remain faithful to the Lord. It's likely that God has tested you on many occasions in the past. And some you may have failed. And some you may have passed. But the fact that you are here this morning means you haven't failed the ultimate test. You haven't given up on your faith in Jesus Christ. The fourth thing that the Lord had done in the past for his people is the Lord had provided for you. In verse 3 and 4, Moses says, He fed you with manna. Your clothing did not wear out on you and your foot did not swell these 40 years. God tested their faith by sending them into the wilderness where there was no food, but God provided food for them. They travelled for 40 years and yet their clothes did not wear out. They travelled for 40 years and yet their feet didn't swell. And God provides for our needs as well. Every day we sit down at our meals and remember that God has provided that food for us. Jesus teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Because God provides for the needs of his children. Our food and our clothes and our good health and our intellect and our strength for that matter are all gifts from God. We often pray for healing when we or our loved ones are sick. But how often do we thank God that we don't have swollen feet? How often do we thank God for the clothes in our wardrobes? How often do we thank God for the people in our lives who care for us? How often do we thank God for the work that we have and the money we have in our bank accounts? Over and over, God provides for our needs. The fifth thing that the Lord had done for his people is that he taught them. The reason why God provides for our needs is that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. In providing for our physical needs, God teaches us that only he can meet our spiritual needs. Just as we need bread to keep our physical bodies healthy, so we need God's word to keep our souls and our hearts healthy. Every time you eat, remember that you don't only need food for life, you need God's word to teach you how to live. That's why it's so appropriate every time you eat, you also open up the Bible and read so that God might nourish your physical body and your soul at the same time. You and I need to be taught how to live through God's word. Moses says in verse 5, Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. Like we saw in the second sermon of this series, the word disciple is probably better than the word discipline. God isn't punishing us when we go through times in the wilderness or when he humbles us or when he tests us. Rather, he's teaching us. He's growing our faith. He's discipling us. Like a parent teaches their child, so God teaches us. And yes, sometimes that might involve discipline and hard lessons. But the point isn't to hurt us, but to help us. It's not to harm us, but to grow us. The things that God has done in the past are meant to teach us that he's a loving father who is with us. 
Like the Lord did so much for his people in the wilderness, so the Lord has done so much for you and me. He has led us and humbled us and tested us and provided for us and taught us. God has walked with us every moment of our lives. So how should you and I respond to God's provision? Well, in verse 6, Moses says, So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. Firstly, we're to keep his commandments. Because of what God has done for us, because of everything that he has given to us, we're to give him our obedience. We're to do what he says. Again, it's what God does first that motivates our response, our obedience, not the other way around. Secondly, we're to walk according to his ways. To walk is another way of describing how we are to live our lives. We're to live according to the way that God tells us in his word. We looked at what it means to walk according to God's ways in the third sermon when we unpack the Ten Commandments. To walk according to God's way means putting him first. It means worshipping him, revering his name and keeping Sabbath. It means honouring your parents, cherishing life, esteeming marriage, respecting others' property, valuing truth and not coveting. Because of what God has done for us in the past, we walk according to his ways. And thirdly, we're to fear him. On one level, fear means fear. It means to be afraid of God's righteous anger and his divine judgment. But for God's people, it means to revere God and to respect him. Because of what God has done for us in the past, we're to honour him. And ultimately, as Christians, we're to remember our Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest thing that God has done in our past is to send Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. You see, the problem with the wilderness is that you and I are often led by our own desires rather than by the Lord. The problem with the wilderness is that we refuse to humble ourselves, we fail the test, we ignore God's provision and we refuse to learn the lessons that God is teaching us. You know, you go back to that list of five things there. You know, that's what God is trying to do. But our problem in our lives is that we don't follow any of that stuff. We, we fail the test. We don't humble ourselves. We ignore God's provision. And we don't listen to his lessons. But when Jesus was in the wilderness, when he was there without food for 40 days and 40 nights, He actually quotes our text this morning. He says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, unlike us, Jesus was led by the Spirit. Unlike us, Jesus humbled himself before his heavenly Father. Unlike us, Jesus passed the test. Where God's people and you and I fail time and time again, Jesus did not fail. Zechariah, the one whose name means remember the Lord, sings, the Lord has provided for us a mighty saviour. God has provided for you and me what we most need, someone to pay the price for our failures and our sins and our pride. Brothers and sisters, remember the Lord's provision in your past. And in particular, remember the Lord's provision of a saviour, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for you. Remember that the Lord has provided for all of your needs. But Moses also calls us not just to look to what God has done in the past, but to remember the Lord in the future. 
Firstly, Moses tells them exactly what the Lord will provide for his people in the future. Verse 7 to 9. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks and of water, of fountains and springs flowing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. Basically, the Lord is going to give you everything that you need. In fact, the Lord will give you more than you need. You'll never have scarcity. Everything that you desire, you'll find in this good land that I'm giving you. And how true is that for most of us? The Lord has provided you and me with everything that we need. In fact, more than we need. God has blessed our socks off. So how should you and I respond to the Lord's provision? Well, firstly, Moses tells us to bless the Lord. Verse 10, And you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. When God blesses us, it is only appropriate that we should in turn bless him. David writes in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. When God forgives our sins, we are to bless him. When God heals our diseases, we are to praise him. When God redeems our life from hell, we are to worship him. When God crowns us with steadfast love and mercy, we are to sing his praises. When God fills our lives with so much good, we are to glorify him. For all that God has done and for everything that he will do, we are to bless his holy name. That's how we respond to all the good things that God has done and will do for us. We're to bless him. Secondly, we're not to forget the Lord. Verse 11, take care lest you forget the Lord your God. It's so easy to forget God. Our world tells us that the only thing that exists is the material world. The world that you can see and touch and hear and smell and taste. Our world has forgotten God. They have forgotten that someone created everything they can see, touch and smell. And the truth is we can forget God as well. God's people in the Old Testament forgot the Lord time and again. In the time of the judges. The people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God. The prophet Isaiah writes, For you have forgotten the Lord or the God of your salvation and have not remembered the rock of your refuge. The prophet Jeremiah says, Does a young woman forget her jewellery, a bride, her wedding ornaments? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. It's so easy to forget the Lord when you have everything you need. When you have fridges and cupboards full of food, you forget to ask the Lord for your daily bread. When you have good health, you forget to thank God for your health. When you have a well-paid job and a house and a car, what do you need God for? It's so easy in the midst of God's provision to forget the one who provided it all. And Moses says, when you have full houses and everything else that, that God has provided for you, don't forget him. Thirdly, Moses says, remember to obey the commands of the Lord. Verse 11 says, you forget the Lord by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes. The way you forget the Lord is to not remember to live the way God called you to live. 
in thanksgiving for him, in obedience to him. Conversely, the way to remember the Lord is to do what he says, to live the life that he's called you to live. It's very practical. It's not a mental thing. It's a lifestyle thing. You remember the Lord by doing and living the way he calls you to. You forget the Lord by just going your own way, doing what everyone else in this world does. Isaiah says about God, you meet him who joyfully works righteousness, those who remember you in your ways. We remember the Lord in his ways by doing what he's commanded us to do. And Isaiah says, God meets with those who joyfully do what is right in his eyes. When you remember to do life his way, God is with you in that. He meets you. You remember the Lord by putting him before your stuff. You remember the Lord by putting people before your stuff. You remember the Lord by living his way. Fourthly, when God gives us future blessings, we need to remember not to become proud. Verse 12 to 14. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and your gold multiply and all you have is multiplied, then your hearts be lifted up. Basically, when all the good things that God gives you have increased, then it's likely that your opinion of yourself will increase, your head will get bigger and your arrogance will grow. As God multiplies good things to you, your arrogance will multiply and your pride will multiply. The danger when our lives look good is we start to think that we are good. The more we have, the better we think we are. Jesus says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. How sobering is that? When God blesses your socks off, the danger is you focus on all the blessings and you forget God. The danger is you start to think, look how good I am, rather than look how good God is to me. When you have everything you need and more, do not become proud. And the reason we don't become proud is because It's all God's. Moses says in verse 17, Beware lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. It's so easy to think that everything I have, I have earned. I have a nice house because I studied hard at school and I went to uni and I got a good job and I I worked hard for 20 or 30 years. I did all this. Or I've got such a great marriage because I'm a nice person and I work hard on my my marriage. Or I've got such great kids because I'm a good parent and I invest time and energy into my kids. We say, I do everything and I look what I've done. But Moses says, beware saying stuff like that in your heart as if it's all you. Because it's not all you. Instead, Moses says in verse 18, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. Your ability to earn wealth comes from God. Your ability to learn, to absorb and understand information comes from God. Your ability to be kind and considerate of others comes from God. If God was to lift his hand off you, you would lose all those things. Those things, your strength and your intellect and your character are all gifts from God. Just as an example, I grew up in the same family as my brother, younger brother Dan. And yet I find studying easy and he doesn't. And he finds mechanical devices simple and I don't. God wired each one of us differently. 
On what basis do I think that I'm better than my brother Dan? Just because God gave me a different brain than him. Remember that everything you have is ultimately a gift from God. He knit you together. He wired you to be the person you are. You have nothing to be proud about. It's all him. Finally, remember what happens to those who forget the Lord. Verse 19. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you that today that you shall surely perish. If you forget that it's all about God and instead just live for yourself, you will perish. If you forget to walk God's way and just follow the world, you will perish. If you think that there's nothing more to life than this, that's all you'll get, just this life. But God wants, has so much more in store for you than just this life. What we're to remember is that Jesus perished for us. Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. When God blesses your socks off, don't forget the Lord. Don't become proud. Don't say, it's all my efforts that got me all of this. But instead, remember what Jesus has done for you on the cross. Remember to obey the Lord, for everything you have comes from him. Remember what God has done for you in the past, how he led you through the wilderness, how he humbled you and tested you and provided for your needs and taught you, and how he gave his son for you on the cross. Remember to bless the Lord. Remember to walk according to his ways. Remember to fear and respect him. Brothers and sisters, whatever life brings, remember the Lord. Remember what he has done for you in the past and don't forget him, whatever the future brings. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to this morning remember that all the good things that you have done for us in the past are gifts from your hand. Lord, we want to remember how you have led us through life to this very point. We want to remember how you've humbled us in the past, how you've tested our faith. Lord, we want to remember how you've provided for our needs. Lord, we want to remember the lessons that you have taught us in the past. And Lord, mostly, we want to remember the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Because, Lord, all the spiritual blessings we have aren't because we're so good, but because of your goodness to us in Jesus. Lord, we can stand before your throne and sing your praises only because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And, Lord, when you bless our socks off, when you give us more than we need, Lord, we pray that we would bless you in return. That, Lord, we would not become proud. That we would not think it's all of us. But that, Lord, we would remember that it's all you. Lord, we thank you for your rich blessings in our lives. And, Lord, we, we hope that you'll provide for our needs in the future. And, Lord, when you do, we want to remember to thank you for your goodness to us then. Lord, Save us from the pride of our own hearts that so quickly says it's all me. It's all what I did. It's all the good choices I made. And Lord, may we see that your hand has been upon us from the very beginning. That Lord, it's you who has given us strength. It's you who have changed our character. It's you who have given us everything that we have. So Lord, we want to bless your name. We want to follow in your ways and we want to bring you glory and honour. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.